Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves, their spot is not the spot of his children, they are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requit the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath brought thee? He hath not made thee and established thee. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inher inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's proportion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in the waste hallowing wilderness. He led them about, and he instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead them, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the filthy rocks, butter of kin, and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs, and rams of the breed, of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But Je Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful, and hast begotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them, I will see what their end shall be. Be for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, I will spread mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, and devoured with burning heat. And with bitter destruction I will also send the tenth of beasts upon them, with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without, and terror within, shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I said, I would scatter them into corners, I would make the rem remembrance of them to cease from among men, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest thy adversaries should be behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. O oh, that they were rise, they that understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had, had sold them, and the Lord hath shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah, 
Their grapes are grapes of gal, their clusters of bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To whom belongeth vengeance and recompense? The foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants. When he setteth, their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices, and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you, and be your protection. See now that I even I am, he and there is no God with me. I kill and make alive, I wound and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven, and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword, and mine hand take hold of judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges unto the en upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hash Hashiah the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, Set your hearts upon the world, which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord spake unto Moses that self same day, saying, Get thee up into the mountain, Aburam, unto Mount Nebu, which is the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession, and die in the mount whether thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people, because ye trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Marabah Kadash, and the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I give the children of Israel. Amen. What a day, what a way to end here the uh, the life of Moses he was told in the previous chapter the day has come that thou shalt die and here God invites him up to this mount Abarim unto Mount Nebo and he said and die there in the mount whether thou goest up only giving him a glimpse of the land that he had toiled for worked for led the people toward the fruit of his ministry being what was left behind and there's such a nation that he knew in the previous chapter they would turn from God, utterly corrupt themselves, leave the way behind in those latter days, provoking God to anger at that time. And so this song goes forth as accumulation of everything that has previously been penned by Moses. He sets it out as, as, a, as a final chapter to his life, to his ministry, and, and really he's setting forth here what he wants his people that he's leaving behind to know and to remember. What is this then? Verse 30 says, Moses, verse 30 of chapter 31 says, And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. The purpose of it is back in verse 21. It says, And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. 
For I know their imagination which they go about, even now, before I have brought them into the land which I swear. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. There's the purpose. This song was to not be forgotten. It was to be an everlasting testimony to the people. They were to remember it. They were to rehearse it, recite it often. And that's how you remember things. You repeat them again and again and again and again. And we've had to do that every time we've done a Bible memory verse. Even just one verse committing to memory takes a while. But here God knew and he led Moses to know the same thing that Song is often the best way to get into a man's heart and get in and penetrate his imagination and really make these things stay with him. And so this song shall not be forgotten. This song is not to be forgotten. And this is why it was penned in this way and delivered in this way and that they would remember it forever. Because there's a danger here. If they are to forget this, they're to forget God. And they go in the way of chapter 31 and verse 29. It says, For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. He knew that their works would draw them in the direction of corruption, turning away from the way that God had put forward through Moses. Evil will befall them as a result and there would be utter destruction if they forget these things. And so he put it forth as a song that they could avoid this danger. He gathered all them together to hear what he had wrote, and they sang it in the audience of all the people to commit that thing to memory. And this was the purpose of this, known as the Song of Moses here. Chapter 32 and verse 1. He says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Listen up, he says. God's about to be glorified. And every time God starts bringing his creation into the word and bringing his creation into memory, that means he's about to go and grab some glory for himself. Because the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his amity work. His creation testifies that he is who he says he is. His, testify, his, 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 his creation leaves men, as Romans 1 says, without excuse. They ought to not only know God, but they ought to glorify Him as God and be thankful for all that He has done. And so God here brings to remembrance again, heavens, come here and listen up. Earth, come and hear the words of my mouth. Creation is called to hear, and when they hear, they're able to then declare this wonderful glorifying of God that's about to take place. Verse 2, it says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Listen up. God's about to be glorified. Creation's called to hear and then declare that God deserves the glory for all of these things. He says here about his doctrine that it flows like water. There's a picture for you to just imagine what water does in this world? Well, it comes from above, doesn't it? Whether it's along the ground, the rivers run downward. If it falls as rain, it comes from the heavens above. The water then is pure and purified. It's distilled, he says, and that's how his doctrine comes forth. From above, pure and purified, distilled. And any time water goes through that distillation process and it's, it's, it's cleansed, that's how we receive it. And this is likened unto the doctrine of God. Pure, purified from above. Also, it gives life not only to the herbs and the grass of the field, it gives life to you, this doctrine, this word. You're even likened unto the herb and the grass that receives of the showers, that receives of the dew, that receives of the latter former and latter rain, when God says all flesh is as grass, and the glory thereof. And that's what we are. We're just like this flesh that receives of the word through the water that comes down through the doctrines of Christ. Verse 3, it says, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness to our God. So don't just single that out. That verse is connecting to the previous verses because there's that because there. He says, 
Give ear heavens, I will speak. Hear earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine is about to drop as water, as rain, as dew, and, and nourish the tender herb and fall upon the grass and showers. Why? Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Because I will proclaim the name of the Lord, because I will tell of the name of the Lord. And, and this is an interesting thing about that word name, right? It's not just his name, Jehovah. It's not just his name, Jesus. It's not just his name, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And all these things that are signified as his name, Alpha and Omega and so on and so on. And we're going to see in here in the context, The Rock is another name for him. But that also points to his reputation. You hear it said, that man has a good name. He has a good reputation. He has a good testimony. And God's the same. His reputation, his fame, his glory is what's being talked about here. Published, pointed to, shouted from the rooftops. God's name and his testimony is what here, God, he says, will be ascribed greatness. Greatness will be ascribed unto it. He says, give, render greatness. In other words, glorify God. So because the name and reputation of God is being lifted up, because greatness of God is being highlighted here in what's about to be read, Moses knows that the earth and heavens will hear and speak. He knows that the doctrine will come forth and will nourish. Why? Because everything is glorifying God in this. And that's got to be our motive. Our motivation needs to be to bring God the glory. When that happens, we know that everything that we do is right and good and flows just like water will. The doctrine comes, it flows down like waters, it cleans, it provides nourishment. Why? Because God is being glorified in it. That's the whole reason why it's able to do what it does. It's regarding God. It's, it's pointing to God. And we need to be resolved to glorify God in all things. Why? Look at verse 4. This is one of these wonderful verses that just glorifies God beyond compare. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. He is that rock. The Bible says in the New Testament, that rock that followed them, that they drank from in the wilderness, that rock was Christ. And Moses, in his final words through this song, that he, he, he prays and hopes that people will remember that it would keep them on the straight and narrow, he immediately desires to lift up that rock, that rock that is Christ. And he says, bring him the glory. Show proper reverence to him. Ascribe ye greatness to our God, the rock that begat you. And that is clear, that Christ is the rock. It says it plainly in the New Testament. That rock was Christ. That spiritual walk that followed them in the wilderness, that gave them the water, that rock was Christ. And that's clear unless you're Catholic or you're crazy. The Bible is thoroughly clear on that doctrine. That rock was Christ. And that's who is following him. It's not Peter, of course. The rock is Christ. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth, without iniquity, just and right is he. This is a wonderful example of ascribing greatness to our God. And now look at the comparison. God is lifted up and revered and, 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 sh and shown forth his greatness. His name is being published and declared here. Greatness ascribed to him. And now verse 5. They, this is us, have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and crooked generation. Now, of course, these would be the backslid in Israel. These would be those that have decided not to give God the glory, that decided not to publish the name of God Almighty God and, and, and witness of the rock that begat them. They're corrupt. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and crooked generation. That spot is like a blemish. It's like a mark. It's visible. You can, you can see it. That spot, it's like if I had a big spot here on my shirt because I ate cake and spilled it down. It would be, you'd be able to identify. That's a spot. That spot is not of that shirt, right? And the same is true when they look at a backslidden Christian. The marks, the spot that's on them is not of who they ought to be in Christ. It doesn't reflect that they are his children, the children of the rock, the children of the God of truth. That's exactly what it's saying here. This blemish is not resembling of the children. It says, he is perverse, these, and they are crooked. 
when what they ought to be is instead of perverse and crooked, Christians ought to be principled and we ought to be upright, right? Not perverse, but principled. In other words, having the Bible committed to your heart and following those principles and precepts to the best of your ability and allowing them to guide you. Perverse would be the opposite of that. This crooked generation ought to be upright, not crooked, not bent, not, not turned away from God. They ought to be upright morally in, in their behavior and in their appearance, and they ought to be reflecting his children, not his children with this grotesque spot upon them, this corrupt spot and mark upon them. We can continue down, and in verse 6, it says, Do ye, do ye thus requit the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? When he says that, do you thus requit the Lord? Do you know what that means? Are you rendering back to him? Are you, are you giving him, are you returning the favor of what he has done for you? with this corruption, this perversion, this crookedness, this foolishness, he says. Is this your response to God, whose work is perfect, having these spots and marks and blemishes on you outwardly? Is this your response to God, who's the God of judgment and of truth, has no iniquity in him, and he bought you, just and right is he, and you're going to be corrupt? You're going to wear that mark? You're going to be perverse and crooked in your dealings? Is that how you respond to God's greatness? Is that how you respond to his glory? You render grossness and corruption for the glory that should be revealed in you because you've been bought and paid for by God? He's saying there's a big contrast here. Look at what God is and look at what you have become. Corrupt as a result of the decisions you make. What would you do? You did not hear... You turned from the doctrine that was there to clean you. You would not publish the name of the Lord. You would not give him the proper glory. And as a result, the question is asked, Are you requiting the Lord in this way? O oh, foolish people and unwise, is he not thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? The Bible here says that God bought them, he made them, and he established them, and therefore they should ascribe greatness to him. They should give him the glory for all these things. Remember, this was written, this was sung, so that it would not be forgotten generations to come. And we ought to take these words and do the same with them. Don't forget what God is teaching us here. Here's an example we can read down of how God bought, how God made, and how God established his people. Verse 7 it says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led them about. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spread abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. There was no strange God with him. He made him to ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep and fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats and with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink pure blood of the grape. He bought them. The Bible says in that passage that these people are his inheritance. They're his portion. They're all that he wants when all is said and done. He wants the people as the portion, as the lot of his inheritance. He bought them to that end. He made them even as he made Adam, separating the sons of Adam unto himself and calling them 
down the course of history to be those children of Israel. He made them to be separated unto him. Not only that did he make them, he established them, gave them a proper place. They were to be separate, distinct, holy unto him. That was their reasonable service. He kept the people Israel, Jacob, as the apple of his eye, given them that prominence in his focus. Right before his eyes, he always kept those people, bought, made, established them for his own. And then that question is asked again in verse 6. Do ye thus requit the Lord, O foolish people? Is this how you respond to all that he has done in buying you, and making you, and establishing you? Is this how you return the favor for all that God has done for you? It's a sad case. What did they do? The Bible says in verse 15 there, but Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Jeshurun then is only referred to a few times in the Bible. Uh, in the next chapter as well in Isaiah 44 and verse 2, it's, a, it's Jeshurun, just a little bit differently. That essentially just means the upright one. Jeshurun is used in the context of the scriptures as like this picture of the perfect will of God for Jacob for Israel. What they should have been if they were to render to God his just desert and they were to do according to his will. Jeshurun was the example. But Jeshurun fell from that place of the upright one. He fell from that perfect and right and holy position to become this fat and kicking entity that forsook God and turned from every right and good way. This was the ideal character of Jacob and how quickly they turned away from them. Continue reading in verse 15. He waxed fat and kicked. You know what that talks to? He got spoiled. He ate too much. He got full of meat. And he started to kick, fight back, push against everything that God was doing. I can even see now, I'm thinking about it. Jeshurun would have been this perfect child, but have you ever seen that kid in the grocery store? He's a little chunky because his parents feed him too much junk and spoil him in that way. And then he goes to the grocery store and he wants that extra ho-ho or the Twinkies. And, and he, their parents are like, no, 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 you've had enough there, little Johnny. And he starts kicking and fussing and yelling and screaming and making a huge argument and fight. That's Jeshurun. That child could have been raised healthy. That child, child could have been raised right but he waxed fat and kicked against everything that his parents ought to have done with him but god was perfect he didn't raise jeshurun he didn't raise israel he didn't raise jacob wrongly no the bible says as an eagle stirreth her nest you know gets it just right for them fluttereth over them leads them about instructs them keeps them that's how god as that eagle cared for his people the apple of his eye before him at all times and nevertheless, by their own decisions, they wax fat and kicked. It continues and says, Thou art waxen fat, that thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. His people corrupted themselves. They became completely unprincipled. And as, as opposed to being upright, they became crooked and perverse. They were to be without spot, and yet the spots are on them. The filth, the uncleanness is all over God's people. No longer reflecting what his children ought to reflect, but rather they are marred, they are marked, they have this corruption upon themselves because they have corrupted themselves, their own choice then. They turned from God, they forsook God, they lightly esteemed the rock of their salvation, they grew apathetic. They would not give him glory, though he continued to give them favor. It's just like in Romans 1, they knew God and they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And that's an amazing thing that I realized this week in dealing with, with um, and thinking about myself and, and other people when we get unthankful in our Christian life, when we refuse to see all the good that God is doing for the suffering that we're presently in, it, it sounds harsh, but we all know Romans 1 is that famous chapter that we like to pick on the Sodomites for, right? But if you look in that chapter, where did it all start? It started by knowing God, glorifying Him not as God, and not being thankful. 
We ought to be people that give God the glory. We ought to be people that are thankful for all that he has provided us, lest we behave just like the Sodomites. We can be like that in spirit, can't we? We may not go to the end of that great sin when you follow the path of Romans chapter 1 into its logical end and scriptural end, but the truth is, when we start our days being unthankful for what God has done for us, when we start our days not giving Him the glory for all that He has done, and we start our days just like that downward spiral of the Sodomites started their walk and started their lives. Consider these things. Don't forget them. This is not to be forgotten. Don't wax fat like Jeshurun. Don't kick against what God is saying. Don't forsake Him. Don't lightly esteem the rock of your salvation, but lift Him up, glorify Him, and be thankful for all He has done. We can continue on and read in verse 16 there. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils and not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begot thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. They choose rather to sacrifice to dumb idols, which have eyes but see not, have ears but hear not, have mouths but speak not. They choose to sacrifice unto the creation of their own hands rather than sacrifice and reverence and glorify God that made them and even gave them the hands that they have. They're unmindful of Him. They've forgotten Him, though He formed them to the intent that what? He would be their people. He would be his, they would be his people. They would be separated as sons and unblemished. They refuse that, unmindful of God, forgetting God, and this is the danger. This is why Moses is writing this. This is why he taught them to sing it. Because we need to get back to and be reminded, just like the people of Israel, that we need to worship God that made us and not continually worship the creation of our own hands. This is not to be forgotten. When the upright one, when Jeshurun becomes fat and forgetful, look what happens in verse 19. When the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are a very forward generation children in whom there is no faith abhorred of the father for the children wore the spot of the world the spot of sin the marks of the flesh the marks of the world that god had separated them from keeping them as the apple of his own eye they chose rather to roll around in the pigsty this is not to be forgotten remember these words he says they're forward and they're without faith and again, while this is the first mention in the whole Bible of that world, word faith, it's pointing to the fact that it hasn't been exhibited from that day until now. And it's also showing that that is exactly what God desires of this people. Faith. Front to back in the scriptures. Faith is how to please God. And because these people are unmindful and they've forgotten they were not able to show faith unto him, became that for our generation, provoking him to jealousy, provoking him to anger because of their own decisions and their own choices. And so they will reap what they have sown. And this is the truth for everyone who would name the name of Christ. Anyone who would follow after that rock of their salvation. Anyone who would believe on him. You will continually reap what you sow. Verse 21, it says, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And guess what happens? When they cause God to be jealous, when they provoke Him, it says, I will move them to jealousy with those that are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. You provoke God, He'll provoke you with the arm of these nations that are around us. You make God jealous because you're serving other gods, and he will take a people that was not a people. 
He'll make you jealous. Continue on down in verse 22. We'll read to 29. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. And shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat, with bitter destruction. I also... I will also send the teeth of the beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without and the terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should have them behave themselves strangely, and yet lest they should say... Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Consider your direction. Consider the latter end of everything you do in this life. I say this quite often at least think it to myself, and I learned it when I just joined up with an independent Baptist church in my infancy as a Christian. I learned very quickly that you need to take every thought, every decision, every doctrine, every choice, and you need to walk that thing a few miles up the road. Okay, well, what do I mean by that? Take a doctrine. You just hear a doctrine for the first time, and you're wondering, is this true? Walk it down that road and see practically where that ends up in the Christian life. And it'll give you a good impression of whether or not it's true. Everything that is true has legs. It continues on and on and on and will not end. And the same is true with our decisions. When we're deciding and making decisions and choosing what direction to go, we ought to walk that thing a few miles down the road. Think about where that ends. And that's what God here is saying. They need to be a nation that has counsel among them not be completely void of counsel, not being completely without understanding. He says in verse 29, chapter 32, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider that latter end. Consider the latter end of your decisions today. Consider the latter end of those things. All that God is talking about here is not to be forgotten. It's there is a warning, and we need to be wise and understand these things, lest when we make decisions to move God to jealousy, unless we make decisions to provoke him to anger, we then ask ourselves, why is God making me jealous of this people that never knew God? And why is God provoking me with this nation that never called upon his name? Why? Because that's the logical end of things, reaping what you've sown. And had they considered their latter end, they would have been in a much better position now. And this is the whole reason why Moses wrote to them and why he's writing to them now, is that they would... See, verse 4, that he is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. And he's the one who are we to follow, who we are to look toward. And yet after that, he immediately just shows the result of not doing that. It's a warning there. It's an exhortation to be wise and to understand these things and to choose the right path. Be principled and upright as opposed to perverse and crooked. Don't let yourself get corrupted by this world. Don't let yourself wear that spot of sin, that spot that indicates to everyone around you that can't be a child of God. What do you mean? Look at the spots on him. Look at the sins on her. Look at the attitude she carries. Look at his ways. Look at the decisions that he makes. Look how they lead their family. It's a spot. It's a blemish. And we're to be unblemished in our testimony. Without spot. Without wrinkle. We're to be like Christ. Believe it or not. And that only comes by day by day, moment by moment, verse 20 at the end, having faith. Trusting him. Walking in his path. Being mindful of him. Giving him credit and glory for everything that happens. Being thankful and walking in that. This is not to be forgotten. Not only the song here, but the Lord. And this is why Moses sets this forth. Remember God. Forget him not. Verse 30, it says, 
How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? He's talking here about his people who are void of counsel being destroyed for the lack of understanding and not considering the latter end of their decisions. He's talking about how he would bring in this foolish nation. He would bring in this people that were not a people in order to confound, destroy, and remove them. And all of this suffering falling upon them as a result of being angry, his anger towards them and the decisions that they make. How should one chase a thousand? How should this weak nation put 10,000 to flight? Well, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up, it wouldn't be the case. Verse 30 again. How should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? That's the answer. God sold them. Why? Because they sold God. God shut them up. Why? Because they shut God up and, 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 and stopped hearing him and stopped listening to him and stopped following him and stopped regarding of him and stopped being mindful of him. They forgot God and left off to do according to his will and to follow his counsels, judgments, and truths in the Bible. You forget God, he'll forget you. You always reap what you sow. Verse 31, it says, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. That's indicating that the world should not be able to stand against believers. Their rock, what they're trusting on, is not as our rock. It's not going to gush out water of, of doctrine and give us provision and give us life. That's not what their rock does. Their rock is the opposite. It's dust. It's, it's famine. It's, it's, it's suffering, spiritually speaking. Their rock is nothing like our rock. And so why does their rock lead them to destroy God's people? Because that's what God's people asked for. They didn't, they didn't esteem their rock properly. They weren't mindful of the rock that bought them, the God of their salvation. We ought to overcome. The world is like, verse 32, for their vine is the vine of Sodom. And of their fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons, and the cruel venom of ass. That defines that foolish nation. That describes that enemy whom God uses to show his wrath upon his people because of their decisions. Verse 34, it says, Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasure? Now, as we read this portion of scripture, it starts to get a little confusing to me because it almost seems like he's blending them and their rock and, and, and God's people who ought to be trusting in the rock but aren't because they've made idols, because they've, because they've forsaken him, because they've chosen that way. And he starts to actually blend them. What he's indicating is that because you weren't mindful of the rock and you clung to their rock, I'm going to show you what it's like for them trusting in an idol, trusting in a God that cannot save, trusting in this world and themselves really. In other words, he takes his people who he wanted to be separate and he just says, fine, you be with them. And when that happens and God's anger falls upon them, yeah, he uses this nation against his people. But every single time God brings in a foreign nation to destroy his people, that nation gets destroyed right after. In other words, the judgment of God falls upon the world because of the hedge of protection was removed. It's basically like if God went to Egypt, right? And he was going to wipe out all of the firstborn sons with that death angel. And he said to all of God's people, have my spot upon your house. Put the blood on the doorpost and then you'll be safe from the death angel. It's almost like God said, do that and you'll be safe and they just refused. They were unmindful of God that bought him. They did not want to follow his simple instruction to wear his spot, to wear his mark, to, to be identified as a child of God and therefore when the death angel come around, he had no choice but to just wipe them all out in their firstborn. They did not do according to God's will. They did not have the faith to follow through with God's plan for their life. And as a result, they're judged with the people of this world. This foolish nation that was void of counsel, this enemy, yeah, they were brought in to provoke God's people to jealousy. Yeah, they were brought in as that foolish nation to judge them. 
I think part of that judgment of the world falling upon believers at this time is so that God could take a remnant and pluck them out of that. They would see, I don't want to fall into the judgment of this world. I don't want to fall into the judgment that's coming on Canada. I don't want to fall in the judgment that's coming on North America, on the world right now, when God finally has had enough. So I need to wear his mark. I need to pull myself out of it. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be completely removed about it. All that to say this, I think the lines are starting to be blurred between God's people, between the people of this world, and wouldn't you know it to be so? Why would you know it to be so? Why? Because they reaped what they sowed. They wanted to be of the world, so God says, okay, be judged with the world. So verse 34, it says, Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among thy treasures? When you look at something being laid up in store, it's often God's judgment. He's long-suffering. He's patient. And so he lays up in store. He has his judgment, his wrath waiting for such a day as it needs to fall. And it's there sealed up among his treasures. Verse 35, it says, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that they shall come upon them make haste. The things that shall come upon them make haste. So the day is coming, certainly. And look, God's people will not be exempt from it. That God's vengeance will fall. His foot, their foot will be caused to slide. Their calamity is at hand. And all of these things, the curses of the scriptures, will come upon them if they don't do something about it quick. If they don't turn to God. And we've learned all about that. If they don't follow after his commandments and his laws and his judgments of his statutes. If they're not mindful of him, if they don't give him the glory, then they're just going to get wiped away just like the rest of the world that didn't even know God to begin with. And what a sad state that is to know God, glorify him not as God, and not be thankful, and to fall in the condemnation of the wicked, though you are in spirit, righteous. Isn't that a sad thing for Christians to be judged as the wicked on this life and this earth, even though they are glorified in heaven, even though they have a perfect man living inside of them, even though they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, it happens though. Why? Because they choose to wear the spot of this world. We need not do that. We shouldn't do that. Vengeance, calamity, recompense, these should be for the enemies of God, not towards God's people. But here's the problem. Jeshurun was to be Exactly that. Upright. The upright one. He chose to become corrupt, to become perverse, to become crooked, to become just like the world around him. Verse 36, For the Lord, sh him, for the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. He's saying here that God will eventually repent himself for the sake of his servants when he sees that their power is gone, when he sees that there is none shut up or left. you know what that says? It's like that, that verse in the end of times. It's except, you know, except those days should be shortened, no flesh should be saved. When God's judgment comes, whether, whether you're atheist, agnostic, Hindu, Buddhist, or Christian, call yourself that. If you are not in God's care, You'll be judged harshly and severely in this life. Until, the Bible says, there is no power left. They're shut up. There's none even left at this time. His judgment has thoroughly come through. Vengeance and recompense has fallen. There is not going to be a lot that are spared at the end of all that. Verse 37, And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. He needed to reserve and preserve a remnant so he could at least ask them, okay, call on your gods now. You've made this dumb idol. You've set it up. You've offered it drinks. You've offered it sacrifices. Now let it speak. Now let it save you. Now let it be your help and your protection. God's getting glory here. And unfortunately, sometimes God has to push 
everyone to the brink of utter destruction before they'll finally fall on their knees, profess Him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's going to be at the very last of days. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let that not be your state, (laughs) Christian. Let it not be that you go through sufferings and go through turmoil and go through um, great vengeance of God in this life before you finally acknowledge Him, give Him glory. Don't be trusting in your idols as these people trusted and how they fell. Don't follow that path. Verse 39 says, See now, and here God's going to just finalize it all. So He brings judgment and vengeance and recompense to the logical end where there is none left except He stops. When He stops, He calls out to them, Where are your gods? Go trust them. I think that's a rhetorical question. I don't think anyone's going to answer. But then he says in verse 39, See now? Do you see all this? See what happens? Right? It's like, it's like with little kids, right? You say, don't touch that. Don't, don't do that. I'm warning you. And then they do it and they're, oh, burned or hurt, injured. See now? God here says, see now that I, even I am he, there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver you out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Your gods, can they do that? He says, if I wet my glittering sword in mine hand, take hold on judgment. I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. And that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Verse 43 shows us where we want to be. We want to be rejoicing as his people. We want to be avenged as his servants. We want to have vengeance rendered to the adversaries but have mercy upon us and upon our land. That's where God's people need to be. That's where we need to abide. And how do we get there? By faith. How do we get there? By trusting Him, giving Him glory, by rendering unto Him proper fear and reverence. Ultimately, God gets the glory no matter what goes on in this life. But He's showing us here that there is a people that are called His servants that He will have mercy upon and care for when judgment like this falls. And you want to be named among that multitude. Don't forget these things. Ultimately, God gets all the glory. Let's glory with Him. Let's rejoice with Him. How do we do that? See now that I, even I am He, there is no God with me. There is no substitute. There is no option. One God one faith, one baptism, one Lord who is above all and in all and through you all. That's where we need to be focused in our lives. And Moses brings this to his people. The last thing he says to him is, look, he is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment a God of truth without iniquity, just and right is He. Don't corrupt yourselves. Don't be perverse. Don't be crooked and suffer with that generation. Be principled. Be upright. Be devoted to God. Have faith in Him. Trust Him. Follow Him. Understand what He is teaching you and learn from Him. 
Get into these precepts. Remember this song. Rehearse it often. Rehearse it daily. So righteousness. So judgment. So truth and reap of the same. This is what Moses has been teaching and he's just compiled it into a song for us. Blessings come upon those that trust and obey. Curses come upon those that have no faith and deny the God that bought him. Unmindful, forget him. So that he has to step in and say, where are your idols? Are they going to save you now? Do you see now who I am? This is what God is telling his people. Do you see now? I kill, I make alive. I wound, I heal. He says, give me glory. We'll continue on, verse 44, and it says, And Moses came and spake all the words of this song into the ears of the people, he and Hosea, the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all the words to all Israel. And he said unto them, I love this, Set your hearts to all the words which I testify among you this day. In other words, set those words in your hearts. Set your words, set your hearts to these words. Let these words into your heart. Which ye shall command your children to observe to do, continue in these things, and have generations after with that same word set in their heart. Their heart set to that word. Your children to observe to do all the words of this law. The words testified. The words of this law. It says in verse 47, For it is not a vain thing. It is not empty. It is not useless. It is not pointless. This word is of utmost importance. Why? Because it is your life, he says. It is not a vain thing for you to what? To set your hearts to these words. It is not a vain for, thing for you to teach these words to your children. All the words of this law. It is not a vain thing. It is not empty. It is not pointless for you to do these things. Why? This is your life. This is the point. This is, what is the meaning of life? There it is. This is your life. Set your hearts to these words. Teach these words to your children. All the words of this law. And do them and obey them and follow them. This is your life. And it says, And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whither ye go over to possess it. Verse 48. And the Lord spake unto Moses that same self day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. Moses came all this way to just behold that land from the other side. Verse 40, it says, And die in the mount whither thou goest up. Be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people, because ye trespassed against me among the children of Israel. And look, this isn't exclusive just to the children, the parents, the grandparents. It's all-encompassing even the great Moses, the leader of the people Israel. God says to him, because ye trespassed against me, there's a consequence here. Because ye trespassed against me, while I have great mercy for you, in this ye've disobeyed, and in this you have suffered loss. He says, because you have trespassed Against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah, Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because he sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. What was that? His trespass? He smote that stone twice, didn't he? But Christ said, even in the New Testament, he's once suffered the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Not our verse? First Peter. 18. Christ once hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. And Moses, in acting that out, smote it twice. And that was enough for God to say, you won't see the promised land. You will suffer loss as a result of that trespass. As a result of not properly sanctifying me before the people. As a result of Moses, unfortunately, corrupting yourself. As a result of being perverse and crooked in this thing. 
instead of being principled and upright, because of this sin, because you did not have faith to do what I said, Moses, because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel, yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I give unto the children of Israel. I don't think of myself as a Moses, but in this way, that there are probably areas that I have trespassed and as a result will not receive the fullness of what God has for me. But we don't need to give up. We don't need to stop there. There's another day to set those idols aside. Set those transgressions aside. Confess your sins to God and come to Him and get back to being that Jeshurun, being that upright one, following God, remembering Him, esteeming Him properly, that you can walk with Him and He can have His fullest way with you. The Song of Moses is there to the end that His people would hear this witness of testimony against them and not forget it. We need to do the same. Be strong and have a good courage. Walk in these things, in these truths. Be Jeshurun. Be that upright one. By faith. Amen. Thank you, Father.